Welcome to this year's Bureau of Standards Annual Required Training for Great Fire Rescue. This training will address all the topics required by the Maine Bureau of Labor. With that, let's get started. So we're going to talk about respiratory protection. A couple things we're going to go over is what is it, when do we need it, what equipment is involved with respiratory protection, who's required to follow the policy, when it can be removed, and fit testing. A couple definitions you can read over real quick. So what is respiratory protection? Uh, it's what we use <clears throat> to protect ourselves from anything airborne, whether it be at a fire scene or an EMS, tuberculosis, to smoke. So when is it needed for EMS? It is any patient that you identify as having tuberculosis, anyone with a cough or fever, anytime you're performing a high risk procedure that could involve getting any type, anything airborne in your system, uh, anytime you believe there's a risk of your patient that's in the ambulance. For a fire, a structured fire, vehicle fire, pretty much any type of fire or any type of gas that could be harmful to yourself. And what do we use? We use the N95 mask and an SCBA. Who's required to follow this policy? Everyone that re responds to any type of call. Anything you believe could be harmful to yourself When can we remove the, your protection? It is only after your incident command has cleared the area with a meter or at the end of the call, maybe your EMS call. Fit testing. Uh, fit testing must be completed every year. This is going to ensure that your mask and N95 mask are fitting properly, so make sure that you're completely safe, as well as having a respiratory questionnaire completed every year. It goes back to the doctor. So today we're going to talk about standards of conduct. You're anything like me when you first got hired here it was very exciting it was great to be doing this job and the thing is it's a really fun job however it also comes with a lot of responsibility and a lot of public visibility luckily there are several things that will guide us um, in how to conduct ourselves appropriately on the job as said there's a lot of visibility but there is also a code of ethics uh, available on the Gray website as well as a personnel policy. Now the personnel policy mostly tells us some of the things we should steer clear of whereas the code of ethics uh, is sort of something we should strive for and some of the things we need to work to do. It states initially as members of this department we have chosen to be part of a team that takes pride in representing this mission through dedication and integrity. There, that's open to a little bit of interpretation, so we're going to go through it and interpret it a little bit. But first, the personnel policy. The key part of the personnel policy is that we will protect the interest and safety of all employees of the town. It also lists uh, several things that we'll just run through really quickly that may be grounds for discipline or termination, but they're fairly straightforward theft or inappropriate removal or possession of property. Obviously, you don't want to grab an iPad out of one of the trucks and take it home. There may be slightly blurrier lines as far as borrowing a tool, taking it home, and forgetting about it. These, again, are things you want to steer clear of. Falsif falsification of timekeeping records is less of an issue when we are finger punching in, but it's also not something where you want to come in late and then have say you came in early and have it adjusted. These are 
pretty straightforward things. Working under the influence of alcohol or drugs or selling alcohol and drugs is unacceptable. Unauthorized use of town-owned equipment, just like if you worked in an office, all the things that we are working with here uh, do belong to the town, so we want to make sure that we are using them appropriately, not damaging them, and in general, the things we work with here may be larger, more expensive, and easier to do damage with. So we just want to make sure that we're qualified on the apparatus and instruments we're using and are extra careful with them. Once again, the things recommended in the personnel policy mostly fall under the standards of, you know, common sense, behave appropriately. Violation of health and safety rules are not accepted. Someone else is going to cover sexual harassment. Um, and in other ways, just unsatisfactory performance and conduct are not OK. Moving on to the t Code of Ethics, which, as I said, is on the Gray Fire Rescue website. That means it's accessible to both the public and ourselves. So it's something we want to be extra aware of. Um, it's not quite as explicit as the personnel policy, but the fact is that the public looks to people in uniform as role models. Little kids play at being a firefighter, police officer, or EMT. You may not be fired for being average, um, but in our job you have the opportunity to be above average, and that's something we all want to strive for. That means when you're wearing gray fire rescue apparel, uh, you're probably not going to the bar and doing things that would be frowned upon by the public. Just be extra aware of that, that you have eyes on you. Um, the Code of Ethics states that we pledge to always answer the call. Of course, we always go to calls as they're dispatched. But that also means treating every call as if it's the most important call of the day, being prepared for it. When you go to someone you've seen two different times that week already, it's still knowing that it's an emergency for them and acting professionally and like it's your priority at the time. We are committed to providing the best public service through innovative training, education, and equipment. This means being aware of what your weaknesses may be. They often tell you when you take some sort of fire or EMS class that you practice the skills most that you are least likely to perform so that you are best prepared for them. That's your responsibility. That's part of being good at your job. We will take Gray Fire Rescue into the future through productive teamwork, open and honest communications, and participative decision making throughout the organization. Uh, for the most part, this means you get very close to the people you're working with. You're with them for 24 hours at a time. Uh, you need to be open to discussing, voicing frustrations, and speaking up when you're uncomfortable with the way things are going. Uh, to have a better working environment and a more successful outcome for the public. Lastly, we are committed to our values, mission, and dedicated to our town. Our organization is driven to provide a cost-effective and efficient public safety department while honoring our values, accomplishing our mission, and achieving our goals. Like we said initially, the personnel policy lists some pretty straightforward, obvious things you should not do, but the code of ethics gives you a higher standard to rise to and achieve. And we're trying to make the best that we can out of Gray Fire Rescue. Thank you. All right, I'll be presenting the topic, Bloodborne, Airborne Pathogens, and our Infectious Control Policy. <clears throat> the purpose of this training is to, uh, to provide a comprehensive infection control system, maximizes protection against communicable diseases for all members uh, and the public that we serve. The scope of the training applies to all members of Gray Fire Rescue who provide fire rescue or emergency medical services for the town of Gray. <clears throat> Our department policy on this topic, um, we are going to provide fire and EMS services to the public without regard for known or suspected communicable diseases in any patient. We're going to regard all patient contacts as potentially infectious. I'm going to provide all members with the necessary training, immunizations, and PPE needed for protection from communicable diseases. So some definitions. Uh, what is a bloodborne pathogen? A bloodborne pathogen are any pathogen, microorganisms that are present in human blood, 
cause disease in humans. Uh, these pathogens include, but are not limited to, uh, hepatitis B, hepatitis C, uh, and the HIV virus. An airborne pathogen uh, is any airborne disease that is caused by pathogens that can be transmitted through the air. The microbes are small enough to be discharged from an infected person by coughing, sneezing, uh, laughing, uh, close personal contact. The discharged microbes remain suspended in the air uh, on dust, particles, and water droplets. Uh, these include TB and influenza. So how are these pathogens transmitted? Uh, they're transmitted throughout uh, through bodily fluids, airborne droplets such as blood, saliva, uh, amniotic fluid, pleural fluid, cerebral spinal fluid, and semen. Uh, as you may not be able to distinguish between these, you should treat all bodily fluids as potentially harmful. So how are we going to do protect the employees? Um, there are going to be three basic types of controls that we're going to use to protect the employee from exposure. Uh, these controls are barrier controls, engineering controls, and work practice controls. So the first of these are barrier controls. Uh, these are controls which create a barrier between the employee and the potentially infectious material. These are commonly called universal precautions or body substance isolation or BSI. Uh, these include all the PPE that Gray Fire Rescue makes available for members to use, uh, such as gloves, gowns, face shields, masks, protective eyewear, BVMs, uh, pocket masks, and the N95 masks. The second type of control is uh, engineering controls. These are devices designed to remove or reduce exposure to hazards. Uh, these include hand washing stations, glove boxes, splash guards, eye washing stations, and sharp containers. And the third type of control are work practice controls. Uh, these controls ensure that employees perform the tasks in a manner that will reduce the risk of exposure to, to infectious materials. These include not eating or drinking in areas of potential exposure, such as the back of an ambulance, includes wearing the proper PPE for the level of exposure involved, and placing sharps immediately into sharp containers. And of course, washing your hands often is very important, preventing these infectious diseases. Some of the prevention that the department offers, uh, all members of Great Fire Rescue are encouraged to receive the Hep B vaccination series. Uh, younger members joining the department now will already be receiving this, these uh, vaccinations uh, as part of their normal immunization series. Members are also encouraged to complete TB testing annually, and the department also offers flu shots on an annual basis to all members. Handling biomedical waste is also very important in preventing infectious control. Another way for us to prevent this is proper handling. All sharps would be immediately placed in sharps containers. Um, these containers would be disposed of at local hospitals, not thrown in the trash. All contaminated items of clothing should be placed in red biohazard bags, and these bags should never be placed in trash receptacles, but again disposed of at the local hospital. So what is an exposure? An exposure to any blood or bodily fluid that comes in contact with a mouth, nose, eyes, an open wound, or a puncture of the skin would be considered a bloodborne exposure. And any exposure to exhaled hair or air droplets of a patient with TB or influenza would be considered an airborne exposure. If you should be exposed to infectious agent, for skin contact, you should flush and wash the area with lots of soap and water. For eye contact, make sure you flush the areas with copious amounts of water at an eye wash station or with normal saline available on the ambulances. If the exposure occurs when you are new to the hospital, you should advise the emergency department of the exposure so they'll be expecting you as an additional patient to the patients you're already bringing in. You need to contact the duty officer or chief immediately along with the infectious control officer for our department, that is Captain Gail Morris. You need to make sure you fill out the appropriate forms, which include report of exposure, uh, the Great Fire Rescue official report, and a workman's comp form.
Any needle stick or blood exposure to an open wound should be considered a significant exposure and should be taken very seriously. Remember when you complete these reports, be very thorough with information describing how, when, and where the exposure occurred, the, po the patient being cared for during the exposure, and a reminder that all information contained in these reports is confidential. Post-exposure, we need to return the ambulance to service and return to Gray as soon as we can. If their member is going to remain at the hospital and a relief is required, contact the duty officer or chief. And depending on the type of exposure, follow-up care and examinations may be required. So to summarize, assume all calls involve some form of infectious material. Appropriately, appropriately use all control available to prevent exposures. If an exposure does occur, notify proper individuals and seek immediate treatment and make sure all appropriate paperwork has been completed. Good afternoon. Here we're here to talk about fire safety and fire extinguisher use in the workplace. Today's objectives will understand the combustion process and different fire classes, understand fire extinguisher types, operating procedures, understand basic firefighting concepts, the acronyms RACE and PASS. The combustion process has three components. The fire triangle is composed of oxygen, heat, and fuel. You need all three components to start a fire. Fire extinguishers remove one or more of these components. Your fire classes, class A fire is trash, wood, paper, cloth, etc. Class B fire are liquids, gasoline, oil, grease, other solvents. Class C fire is electrical equipment, computers, fax machines, iPhones. And class D fires are your combustible metals consisting of magnesium, sodium, potassium, titanium, and other flammable metals. Class K fires, recently recognized by NFPA, are fires involving combustible oils, lards, fats, and commercial cooking. The anatomy of the typical fire extinguisher, on the top you have your discharge lever, below that you have your discharge locking pin with seal, Below that, you have your discharge hose, your discharge nozzle, and your discharge orifice. You also have a pressure gauge, not found on CO2 extinguishers, a carrying handle, a data plate, and also the body of the extinguisher. Pressurized water extinguisher are used for Class A fires only. They're two and a half gallon water extinguishers, which provide approximately one minute of discharge time has a pressure gauge to allow visual capacity check, 30 to 40 feet maximum effective range, and can be started and stopped as necessary. Extinguishes the fire by cooling burning materials below the ignition point. Their carbon dioxide extinguishers for class B or C fires are two and a half to 100 pounds of CO, give about 30, eight to 30 seconds of discharge time, has no pressure gauge or capacity is verified by weight, three to eight feet maximum effective range and extinguishes by smothering burning materials. Its effectiveness decreases as temperature burning material increases. Your typical extinguishers are multi-purpose dry chemicals are for class A, B, and C fires. There are two and a half to 20 pound dry chemical ammonium phosphate give about eight to 25 seconds of discharge time. You will have a pressure gauge to allow visual capacity check and about 5 to 20 feet of maximum effective range. Extinguishes the fire by smothering the burning materials. Fire extinguisher summary. Your pressurized water can works by cooling the fires. Once again, your class A fires. Your carbon dioxide extinguisher operates by smothering the fire. This is for your class B or C fires. Your multi-purpose dry chemical operates by smothering the fire, and this is for an A, B, or C type fire. The acronym RACE, R-A-C-E, Rescue, Alarm, Contain, and Extinguish. Your acronym P-A-S-S, -S, PASS, is pull the pin, the extinguisher, aim the nozzle low at the base of the flames, squeeze the handle, and sweep side to side. 
firefighting decision criteria. Know your department emergency procedures and evacuation routes at all times. Know the locations of the extinguishers in your workplace and how to use them. Always sound the alarm regardless of the size of the fire. Avoid smoky conditions. Ensure area is evacuated. Don't attempt to fight the fire unless the alarm is sounded, the fire is small and contained, and you have a safe egress route which can be reached without exposure to the fire. And available fire extinguishers are rated for your size and type of fire. If in doubt, evacuate. Don't attempt to fight unless you are trained. So in summary, we talked about the combustion process, your fire triangle, your class A, B, C, D, and K type fires, what type of fire extinguishers, your A, B, and C, operating procedures, capacity and limitations, and basic firefighting concepts. Sexual harassment training. Uh, the goals for today's training are to define sexual harassment, to know the laws and the town policy surrounding sexual harassment, to describe the various types of harassment, to recognize when harassment is occurring, and to know the appropriate steps to report it. Sexual harassment is unwanted, unwelcome, verbal, visual, or physical conduct of a sexual nature that is severe or pervasive and affects working conditions or creates a hostile work environment. The laws governing sexual harassment are both federal and state and make it illegal for an employer to permit the harassment of an employee. The federal law is known as Title VII and the state law is known as the Human Rights Law. Harassment becomes unlawful when an employee is supposed to endure the offensive conduct as a condition of their continued employment, or when the conduct is severe or pervasive enough to create a work environment that a reasonable person will consider intimidating, hostile, or abusive. However, remember, the law does not prohibit simple teasing, some offhand comments, or very isolated incidents that are not very serious. To define conduct, conduct is not sexual harassment if it is welcome behavior. Severe or pervasive means that a reasonable person would have to consider it intimidating, hostile, or abusive. That being said, harassment typically comes in two different forms, quid pro quo or a hostile work environment. Quid pro quo, which means something for something, usually is from a superior to a subordinate, requires an employee to submit to sexual harassment to keep their job or to get a promotion. Examples of this could be bribery, promotions or raises, or on the other hand, threatened termination, negative recommendations, negative performance evaluations, or disciplinary action. A hostile work environment is unwelcome comments or conduct that unreasonably interfere with an employee's work performance. Examples of this could be seductive behavior, gender harassment, sexual comments, sexual imposition. These things could happen in four different ways. It could be verbal or written, like comments or text messages, physical, like assault, patting, hugging, or touching, nonverbal, like looking, leering, or stalking, or visual, like drawings, pictures, or posters of a sexual nature. Anyone can harass, just as anyone can be the target of harassment, regardless of sex, sexual preference, age, or professional position. If harassment is occurring, make sure you let the harasser know that his or her conduct is unwanted and unwelcome. If it doesn't stop, go to the supervisor and explain the circumstances. 
and be sure you document, document, document. The Town of Gray policy covers sexual harassment in section 11 of your handbook. Discipline can include up to discharge and make sure that it's reported to the department head, which is our fire chief, and next it will be reported to the town manager. Please know, sexual harassment will not be tolerated, it will be investigated, it will be disciplined, anybody should feel free to report harassment, and no one will be punished for reporting harassment. Any questions? Hi there, today we're gonna to be warning, up, warning about lockout tagout. Our task is to present various procedures, operations, firefighter safety considerations, and occupational safety considerations in order to properly prepare for effective response to hazardous energy situations. Our objectives will be for the firefighter to have an understanding of OSHA 29 CFR 1910.147 hazardous energy policy. For a firefighter to be able to identify the situations that require the use of our hazardous energy policy and for a firefighter to be able to utilize proper procedures in executing lockout tagout. Firefighters shall demonstrate the knowledge of when a hazardous energy policy should be utilized. The firefighter shall understand the required training for the hazardous energy rule. Motivation behind it. Electricity, a common household item, used constantly in our society. And uh, it is an important top to, topic to us. Simply put, electricity could mean death. The known fact that household current, 110 volts, can cause an adult to have a lethal heart arrhythmia that could result in cardiac arrest. Death. When we respond to routine and working incidents, we must look at this concept in a new light. Energy that is properly managed is a tool and properly controlled is an enemy. The amount of energy located in residential services is much different than industrial services. The prevention of electrical shock is important to safe and efficient operations. Service and maintenance of machines and equipment where the unexpected startup of machines or equipment or release of stored energy could cause serious injury to employees. Emergency response procedures for incidents which involve these types of machines or equipment. Establish minimum performance requirements for the control of such hazardous energy. And our application, situations where a guard must be removed or a safety device must be bypassed. Situations where work must be performed in a danger zone. Definitions, the effective employee, an employee who operates or uses a machine or equipment on which servicing or maintenance is being performed under lockout tagout or who works in an area where lockout tagout is used. In our particular case, we will be isolating hazards from the public while responding to emergency calls. An authorized employee, a person who locks out or tags our machines or equipment, performs maintenance or service work. An affected employee becomes an authorized employee when his or her duties include performing covered service or maintenance work. Energize, connected to an energy source or containing residual or stored energy. Energy source, any source of electrical, mechanical, hydraulic, pneumatic, chemical, thermal, or other energy. Energy isolating device, a mechanical device that physically prevents the transmission or release of energy, including, but not limited to, manually operated electrical circuit breaker a disconnect switch, a line valve, a block, any similar device used to block or isolate energy. Push buttons, selector switches, and other controlled circuit type devices are not energy isolating devices. Lockout. The placement of a lock device on an energy source isolating device in accordance with an established procedure, ensuring that energy isolating device and that equipment being controlled cannot be operated until the lockout device is removed. Lockout device, a device such as a lock, either a key or combination type, or blank flanges and bolted slip binds. To hold an energy isolating device in a safe position and prevent the energy of a machine or equipment. Tagout, the placement of a tagout device on an energy isolating device in accordance with an established procedure to indicate that the energy isolating device and the equipment being controlled may not be operated until the tagout device is removed. Tagout device, a prominent warning device such as a tag and a means of attachment that can be surely fastened to an energy isolating device. Servicing and maintenance, 
Workplace activities such as constructing, installing, setting up, adjusting, inspecting, modifying, and maintaining and or servicing machines or equipment. Servicing and maintenance activities include lubrication, cleaning, or unjamming of machines or equipment and making adjustments to tool changes where the employee may be exposed to the unexpected energization of startup or the equipment or release of hazardous energy. Procedures. Prepare for shutdown. Before the authorized or affected employee turns off the machine, the authorized employee must know the type and magnitude of the energy and its hazards. The authorized employee must also know how to control the energy. Shutdown. The device or equipment must be turned off following an orderly established procedures. Isolating equipment. The energy isolating devices, disconnect switches, circuit breakers, valves, etc. must be physically located and operated by the authorized employee. Applying a lockout tagout device. The authorized employee is to apply lockout tagout devices to each energy isolating device. Tagout devices must clearly indicate that moving the energy isolating device from the safe or off position is prohibited. Releasing stored energy. Any potential hazardous stored or residual energy from all sources and components must be released. Methods for releasing stored energy include leading off pressure, blocking elevated parts, draining lines, letting equipment cool, discharging capacitors, other methods as specified. Verification. The last step is critical. The employee must verify that the machine or equipment is in a zero energy state. Only after all steps have been completed is it safe to begin maintenance or, op or service operations. This includes emergency operations involving this type of equipment. Release from lockout tagout. Check the machine. Replace all guard safety devices. Remove all tools and non-essential items. Remove any blocking devices. Ensure that the machine is intact and ready to operate. Ensure that all employees are in a safe area before removing any lockout tagout devices. Remove the lockout tagout devices. The lockout tagout devices may only be removed by the authorized employee who applied them. Resume normal operations. The authorized employee grants permission for the effective employees to resume normal, oper normal equipment machine operations. Use of tagout alone. Guidelines for tagout only systems. Tags are only warnings. Tags must be not be passed by, should only be removed by the person who placed them, must be legible, bilingual if needed, must hold up under conditions of use, may evoke a false sense of security, understand the why or how of tagout procedure, fully comply with all lockout tagout procedures. Training requirements. Three areas of lockout training, tagout training. Authorized employees, affected employees, other employees. Authorized employee. Recognize hazardous energy sources, identify the type of mag and magnitude of energy sources, isolate and control hazardous energy. Affected other employees. Know why these procedures are used. Understand that they are never to attempt to restart equipment that has been locked or tagged out. Ongoing training. All employees should receive training when their job assignment changes, the lockout tagout procedure changes, new hazards are presented by changes in equipment, machines, or processes. Everyone should receive annual refresher training. Emergency response personnel must be informed of the lockout tagout procedures, must understand and comply with procedures. At no time shall the procedures of outside personnel be substandard to OSHA standards. You've no doubt heard the term hazard communication and the acronym MSDS, short for Material Safety Data Sheet. The hazard communication standard requires employers to train employees about the hazards of chemicals and substances in the workplace. In 2003, the United Nations adopted the globally harmonized system of classifying and labeling chemicals. Here's a new acronym you'll be hearing a lot more in the future, GHS. The GHS includes criteria for the classification of health, physical, and environmental hazards, as well as specifying what information should be included on labels of hazardous chemicals, as well as safety data sheets. Since 1992, the United Nations have been working to create and enhance a globally harmonized system for the classification and labeling of chemicals that can be used by importers, distributors, and manufacturers worldwide. The United States was an active participant in the development of the GHS 
and is also a member of the UN bodies established to maintain and coordinate implementation of the system. The Occupational Safety and Health Administration, or OSHA, has mandated changes to the existing hazard communication standard that adopt the globally harmonized system. In this video, we'll go over information about the new globally harmonized system of hazard communication. Specific changes to be discussed include new container label formatting, product identifiers, signal words, pictograms, hazard statements, precautionary statements, and safety data sheets. On or before June 1, 2015, all of the following changes to the hazard communication standard will take effect. Material safety data sheets, or MSDS, will become safety data sheets, or SDS. The new SDS will serve the same purpose as the old MSDS. The SDS will be in a standardized format and easier to read. Labels on hazardous chemicals will include pictograms which visually identify the main hazards. Signal words will be required on all labels where hazards exist. The signal word warning will indicate less serious risks and the signal word danger will indicate more serious risk. Hazard statements will be required on labels to explain what the hazard is. Precautionary statements will be required to explain what you should do to protect yourself from the hazard. All labels will be required to have pictograms, a signal word, hazard and precautionary statements, the product identifier and supplier identification. Labels will vary but must still contain all the following elements. Product identifier. This can be the chemical name, code number, or batch number. The manufacturer, importer, or distributor can decide the appropriate product identifier but the same product identifier must be on both the label and in section one of the SDS. There are two signal words in the GHS system, danger and warning. These signal words are used to communicate the level of hazard on both the label and the SDS. The appropriate signal word to use is set out by the classification system. For example, the signal word for self-heating substances and mixtures Category 1 is danger, while warning is used for the less serious Category 2. There are occasions where no signal word will be called for. The GHS will require pictograms on labels to alert users of the chemical hazards to which they may be exposed. Each pictogram consists of a symbol on a white background framed within a red border and represents a distinct hazard. The pictogram on the label is determined by the chemical hazard classification. There are eight pictograms required by the new standard and one that is optional. The health hazard pictogram is used for chemicals that pose a risk to your health if used improperly. The flame pictogram indicates there is a risk of fire and you should be especially concerned about ignition sources and combustible materials. The exclamation mark pictogram will usually be used in combination with a health hazard pictogram to signify particular health risks which are less severe than the skull and crossbones category. The skull and crossbones pictogram will usually be used in combination with a health hazard pictogram to signify particularly hazardous chemicals. Chemicals with acute toxicity are chemicals that will produce adverse effects following a single dose of the substance. The gas cylinder pictogram alerts you to the physical hazards inherent in the use and storage of compressed gas. The corrosion pictogram should prompt you to be especially aware of PPE and storage requirements. Chemicals marked with an exploding bomb pictogram pose a significant physical risk and should be treated with extreme caution. Oxidizers are chemicals that produce additional oxygen in an environment which may cause or contribute to the combustion of other materials. These chemicals will be indicated with a flame over circle pictogram. The environment pictogram is a non-mandatory category. I've included it here for your information. Hazard statements are used to describe the nature of the chemical hazards, including where appropriate, the degree of hazard. All of the applicable hazard statements must appear on the label. Hazard statements may be combined where appropriate to reduce redundancies and improve readability. 
Precautionary statements are defined as a phrase that describes recommended measures that should be taken to minimize or prevent adverse effects from exposure to hazardous chemicals or improper storage or handling. The new GHS standard requires that chemical safety data sheets consist of 16 specific sections. Section 1, Identification includes product identifier, manufacturer or distributor name, address, phone number, emergency phone number, recommended use and restrictions on use. Section 2, Hazard Identification includes all hazards associated with the chemical and required label elements. Section 3, Composition Information on Ingredients includes information on chemical ingredients and trade secret claims. Section 4, First Aid Measures includes important symptoms, effects, acute, delayed, or required treatment. Section 5, Firefighting Measures lists suitable extinguishing techniques and equipment, chemical reactions as a result of fire. Section 6, Accidental Release Measures lists emergency procedures, protective equipment, proper methods of containment and cleanup. Section 7, Handling and Storage lists precautions for safe handling and storage, including incompatibilities. Section 8, Exposure Controls and Personal Protection lists OSHA's permissible exposure limits or PELs, Threshold limit values or TLVs, appropriate engineering controls, and proper personal protective equipment. Section 9, Physical and Chemical Properties lists the chemical's characteristics. Section 10, Stability and Reactivity lists chemical stability and possibility of hazardous reactions. Section 11, Toxological Information includes routes of exposure, related symptoms, acute and chronic effects, and numerical measures of toxicity. Section 12, Ecological Information provides information to evaluate the environmental impact of the chemical if it were released to the environment. Section 13, Disposal Consideration provides guidance on proper disposal practices, recycling or reclamation of the chemical or its container, and safe handling practices. Section 14, Transport Information provides guidance on classification information for shipping, transporting of hazardous chemicals by road, air, rail, or sea. Section 15, Regulatory Information identifies the safety, health, and environmental regulations specific for the product that is not indicated anywhere else on the SDS. Section 16, Other Information includes the date of preparation or last revision of the SDS. For more information on the globally harmonized system of classification and labeling of chemicals, visit this website. The Emergency Action Plan, or EAP, is a written document required by OSHA. The purpose of an EAP is to facilitate and organize employer and employee actions during workplace emergencies. If you are at Central Station and you're faced with a fire, weather emergency, a medical emergency, or an active shooter situation, you would need to follow your emergency action plan for Central Station. The objectives for EAP training are to identify the emergency plan coordinator, describe the preferred means of reporting emergencies, explain the six elements of the emergency action plan. So your emergency plan coordinator is Captain Galen Morrison. He's a safety officer 
His contact information is listed below. Preferred means of reporting emergencies. If it's a fire, explosion, or a bomb threat, utilize the pull station and evacuate. For weather emergencies, radio to fire alarm or call 911 and seek shelter. For a chemical spill or leak, utilize the pull station and evacuate. For medical emergencies, radio to fire alarm, call 911 and respond to that emergency. If there's violence or an active shooter situation, radio to fire alarm, or call 911, evacuate if possible, or seek shelter. The elements of the emergency action plan, the emergency escape procedures and routes, procedures of employees who remain to operate critical operations before evacuating, employee accountability procedures after evacuations, rescue and medical duties, alarm systems, and training. For emergency escape procedures and routes are all posted in their work area and all employees are trained by supervisors in the cor correct procedures to follow. You can see in the picture there is the escape route posted. If you can't evacuate and you need a shelter in place, whether it's for violence, weather, or an active shooter emergency, to try and find a, a room with no windows, lock the door, have a radio or a cell phone for communications, and communicate your location with fire alarm. The procedure of employees who remain to operate critical operations before evacuating. The trained employees are Kurt Alcanic is the chief. His work area is the apparatus bay, and his assignment is reporting. Gail Morrison is the administrator. His work area is the office area, and his assignment is accountability. Employee accountability procedures after evacuations. Each supervisor or designee is responsible for all accounting, all assigned employees. All work area supervisors and employees must report to their designated rally point. Each employee is responsible to report to their supervisor for an accurate headcount. All headcounts shall be reported by name to the emergency evacuation coordinator. The emergency evacuation coordinator shall be located at one of the rally points. So here is a view from Shaker Road. You can see. The primary rally point is off to our right of the two trees. The secondary rally point is over at the main entrance at the Public Works building. Here's an aerial view. So here's our primary rally point. And in the distance, the Public Works building main entrance is our secondary rally point. For rescue and medical duties, on duty medical staff are responsible for providing first aid medical to medical emergencies. Personnel performing rescue medical duties must radio to fire alarm and request a call number and follow all EMS procedures. So here our on duty medical staff have been trained and equipped to carry out their assigned responsibilities properly and safely. Alarm systems. Alarm systems for notifying all employees in case of an emergency are fire pole stations, phone intercom, radio, and the vigil vigilance computer system. So the picture to our left is a picture of the pole station. The picture to our right is a little hard to see, but it's a screenshot of a desktop computer at Central Station. In the lower right hand corner are four icons. You've got one for fire, police, EMS, and an information. If you were sitting at your computer and you had a situation you wanted to report, you could simply click one of those icons, type in your message, and hit send, 
and anybody else sitting at a computer throughout the a town uh, public buildings will see that message and be able to uh, notify necessary people but training Gail Morrison may assist in training all employees on the emergency action plan and training was provided for all employees when the emergency action plan was initiated when employee responsibilities change and when new employees are hired or transferred so that is the emergency action plan for Central Station if you have any questions you can contact your emergency plan coordinator Captain Gail Morrison Next, we're going to show a brief video on Rudd Hyden fight for dealing with an active shooter situation. It may feel like just another day at the office, but occasionally, life feels more like an action movie than reality. The authorities are working hard to protect you and to protect our public spaces. But sometimes, bad people do bad things. Their motivations are different. Warning signs may vary, but the devastating effects are the same. And unfortunately, you need to be prepared for the worst. If you were ever to find yourself in the middle of an active shooter event, your survival may depend on whether or not you have a plan. The plan doesn't have to be complicated. There are three things you could do that make a difference. Run, hide, fight. First and foremost, if you can get out, do. Always try and escape or evacuate even when others insist on staying. Encourage others to leave with you, but don't let them slow you down with indecision. Remember what's important, you, not your stuff. Leave your belongings behind and try to find a way to get out safely. Trying to get yourself out of harm's way needs to be your number one priority. Once you are out of the line of fire, try to prevent others from walking into the danger zone and call 911. If you can't get out safely, you need to find a place to hide. Act quickly and quietly. Try to secure your hiding place the best you can. Turn out lights, and if possible, remember to lock doors. Silence your ringer and vibration mode on your cell phone. And if you can't find a safe room or closet, try to conceal yourself behind large objects that may protect you. Do your best to remain quiet and calm. As a last resort, if your life is at risk, 
Whether you are alone or working together as a group, fight. Act with aggression. Improvise weapons. Disarm him. And commit to taking the shooter down, no matter what. Try to be aware of your environment. Always have an exit plan. Know that in an incident like this, victims are generally chosen randomly. The event is unpredictable and may evolve quickly. The first responders on the scene are not there to evacuate or tend to the injured. They are well trained and are there to stop the shooter. Your actions can make a difference for your safety and survival. Be aware and be prepared. And if you find yourself facing an active shooter, there are three key things you need to remember to survive. Run, hide, fight. and safety and health officer for Great Fire Rescue. Today I've selected a few key items for us to review uh, for this year's training. The statement about our safety and health is that our members are safety each year is accomplished through awareness, education, and training. We spend many hours in uh, training and most of that is uh, geared around the safety of our members. Great Fire Rescue is committed to providing a safe and healthy workplace. Well, I've se selected a few items for your review. Uh, this year in 2018, we'll continue our focus on cancer risk and prevention for firefighters. One key item would be seat belts. It is our policy that seat belts are always used in all of our vehicles and apparatus. In particular, seat belt usage in ambulances, not only for us, but for the patients. Uh, to be used at all times, even in the back. Our patients are to always be strapped on our stretchers with all straps, with a few exceptions. That would be if the uh, procedure that is needed for that patient requires us to remove any or all of the straps. And for our EMS personnel in the back, they're always to be belted. Uh, with the exception if they need to move around, get items, or stand to do any procedure on the patients. If you do make an exception, as far as belting in your patient, you should always record it in your EMS narrative so that uh, in the future we can look back and give a reason why that patient wasn't fully belted. Any passengers that you may take with you, uh, family or friends riding in the front should be instructed to wear their seat belt. And for our fire apparatus seat belt policy, there are no exceptions. They're to be worn at all times. SCBA was another key item that needs to be talked about as far as when to wear them and how to clean them. In all IDLH exposures, they are to be worn, including a couple of key items that we need to remember chimney fires for the, everyone on the roof needs to uh, wear and breathe the air in their SCBAs. Vehicle fires of all kinds, including off-road recreational vehicles. And for structure uh, fires, our SCBA is to be kept on at all times, including the overhaul and investigation, only to be taken off when clearance is given from incident command or the incident safety officer. 
Another key item to remember is our firefighter hoods, which everyone has a spare. Those are to be changed out at rehab as part of our rehab process. Gross decon has been around our department for a couple of years now. Uh, we have ways to do that on each engine company. That should be done at the scene as needed. Uh, back at the station, decon st uh, the straps and SCBA and all the hardware on the SCBA just like you would decon, decon your gear. The apparatus seats and interior also needs to be cleaned and your gear needs to be washed after every exposure or event or at other times as directed by the incident command or safety officer. Roster reports, a couple of items that we need to brush up on. There is a section for seat belt usage which should be filled out that is to uh, ensure that our EMS personnel are continually protected. It will be asking you uh, whether you wore them all the time, sometimes, or not at all. Please be honest with your answers, but I would like to see that section filled out more faithfully. Also, there's a decon section that must be filled out for all IDLH events that is shown here whether or not you did a gross decon at the scene, whether your SCBAs were cleaned, your apparatus was deconned, your gear was bagged for washing, helmets to be included, and whether or not you swapped out your hoods. If you are at any event where SCBA was worn, you should fill this category out. Next to that is the seatbelt question. It's also on the form that we just spoke about. Yes, I wore them, not at all, or some of the time. Medical requirements at Great Fire Rescue are that all people have a Hep B series on file or a declination of such if they choose not to do that. We also ha conduct annual respiratory questionnaires. Those are to be done for all people or all members who wear any kind of respirator. TB testing is also offered each year. You can decline that if you would like, uh, but TB testing is offered each year and recorded. We also are starting to conduct annual hazmat technician physicals. Those will be done on anyone who holds a technician uh, uh, license and done yearly. Also, for all firefighters coming on to the department, they have an initial firefighter physical we hope to this year expand on that and capture uh, physicals for other firefighters who have been on the department for a while. For safety items that uh, come up, whether it's a concern or it's a violation, please do not hesitate to report those to me or the chief uh, or to a senior officer. All accidents and injuries must be reported immediately to the chief and or the safety officer. Those have to be recorded even if they're not uh, followed up on later on as far as uh, a doctor or emergency room visit. They still need to be recorded in a first report of injury that's filed with the town of Gray. All of these items that we've just discussed are included in our SOGs. There are many more out there. All the safety and health SOGs are available for your view at the station. Thank you. Hello, this is the Class C fuel operators training for fueling vehicles in the town of Gray. The state of Maine requires persons who dispense fuel at our facility at Public Works to be trained at the minimum level of Class C. Only a Class AB operator can train a Class C fuel operator. And class C fuel operators must be able to perform safe fueling procedures, recognize fuel leaks and spills, recognize problems with fueling equipment, recognize hazards, address issues, and notify appropriate parties when there is an issue. The fuel pumps, or fuel island, is located behind the salt and sand shed at Public Works. The Town of Gray refueling policy is posted on the pillar between the pumps on the fuel island. It requires no smoking, stay with the vehicle while refueling, 
refuel vehicle on the concrete pad. Any spill needs to be reported to the head mechanic, and if he is unavailable, report to the public safety. Any spill after hours, report to Cumberland County Regional Communications Center, who will report to Department of Public Works Director. The Public Works or Public Safety will advise on cleanup, and Public Works or Public Safety will record any party who's created the spill, the time and date, and the cleanup procedures. Cleanup materials and spill log are located in a spill bucket on the fuel island. The spill bucket is located at the fuel island directly under the fueling policy sign. It contains the spill log, absorbent pads, and speedy dry for small spills. All spills must be recorded in the spill log. All spills must be reported to the DEP within 24 hours with one exception a fuel spill of 10 gallons or less that is spilled on the pavement and is cleaned up before leaching into the ground and does not require DEP reporting. To begin fueling, insert your vehicle specific fueling key at the keypad and follow the instructions. Enter your assigned driver number which is person specific. Enter your specific security number and enter which position you would like to use. Position one is for diesel, that's pump one. Position two is for gasoline, that's pump two. If all entries have been accomplished correctly, the display will read fuel position activated and the quantity of fuel that's in the tank. It's now okay to begin dispensing fuel from the pump. To pump fuel, remove the nozzle, lift the pump lever, insert the nozzle in the vehicle fuel filler, and squeeze the nozzle handle. Remember to follow the rules on the fueling policy sign mounted between the pumps. Complete your vehicle fill up and replace the nozzle and make sure to check for leaks and spills before you leave. If you are presented with an issue that requires a pump shutdown, the cancel clear button on the keypad at the pumps will deactivate the pump. If a fuel spill or fire prevents a safe approach to that keypad, turn the power to the fuel island off at the main breaker in the electrical panel. The Town of Gray's fueling, fuel pumps do not require an emergency shutdown, so the only other method to shut the power off to the fuel pumps is the electrical panel inside the public works garage. Electrical power to the fuel island and the tank monitoring, Omnitech, are located inside the public works garage on the wall nearest the fuel pumps. If the type of event occurs that requires power termination from the electrical panel in the public works garage, you should also be activating the 911 system. Omnitech monitors for leaks between the double walls of the in-ground fuel tanks. If a leak is detected, it will display a light and sound an alarm. The alarm can be silenced, and should you notice this unit in alarm or notify status, the DPW director must be notified. If unavailable, notify public safety. In summary, always avoid fire ignition by not smoking, not using cell phones and discharging static electricity when exiting the vehicles. Stay with the vehicle or pump while fueling and when filling cans or small engines always fill them on the ground. Watch for leaks and spills, malfunctioning equipment and other hazards. Good afternoon for this portion of the training we're going to cover personal protective equipment. Our objectives of this training, we're going to identify what PPE is, determine what type of PPE is appropriate for different emergency scenes, identify the equipment that's needed to protect the respiratory system, and how to maintain our PPE and clean it properly. So when you think of PPE, personal protective equipment, probably the most common thing you think of is structural fire turnout gear. This consists of a helmet, hood, jacket, gloves, pants, and your boots. Uh, currently issued at Gray Fire Rescue, we have Globe G Extreme 3.0. This is some of the latest turnout gear providing the best protection against heat and moisture. Uh, turnout gear is made of two layers to protect us against all the hazards that we see in our job. It also is constructed of Kevlar, which is cut and abrasion protective. Some of the safety features that our turnout gear has is an integrated drag rescue device. This is a piece of webbing 
that loops through the jacket itself. There's a handle that you pull on the back if a firefighter is down and needs to be rescued out of a, a building. It also features foam knee pads that are heat resistant so you don't get burned when you're crawling on the ground. And it also has harness loops for a self-escape system so you can have a rope and bailout kit should you need to get out of a building. Turnout gear is best suited for structural firefighting, chimney fires, alarm sounding calls, and car fires. So another type of PPE, probably what we do more of these days, is EMS calls. Our day-to-day -day daily duty uniform is made up of a uniform shirt, pants, and boots. When we're on a call on the ambulance, we'll add an addition to that of nitrile gloves, safety glasses, face shield, and always have your radio so you can call for help. This provides us protection against bloodborne pathogens, which are your body fluids, blood, saliva, and vomit. And you're going to see this most used on EMS calls, cardiac arrest, stroke, trauma, and car accidents, in addition to supplemental gear, which we'll get into later. Recently added this year with the call volume increasing of domestic violence, overdoses, police standby, and active shooters, we've had to go to some sort of ballistic armor, or body armor, we call it. This is NIJ, NIJ certified, level 3A, which is ballistic protection up to 44 Magnum handgun. It also provides stab protection, which is something we'll probably see more of, be it scissors, a knife, pencil, just a patient that's trying to harm us or themselves. Uh, the ability to add plates to this armor increases the rating in the case of an active shooter where there's more of a rifle threat. Uh, another good thing to add to the body armor is trauma bandages, quick clot, and a tourniquet, not only for your patient, but to take care of yourself should something go wrong. Another important piece of equipment to have is the respiratory protection for structural firefighting. This would be an SCBA, self-contained breathing apparatus. We currently run Scott 4.5 SCBAs. They provide protection against toxic smoke and heat, which is a big cancer-causing agent. Uh, it also has an integrated pass alarm, which is an alarm that sounds if a firefighter is downed and not responsive or moving for a set amount of time. This also has the universal RIC connection, which allows the bottle to be refilled if you run out of air from a RIP pack that another team will bring into the building. On the EMS side, we use a N95 filtered face mask. This provides protection against airborne bacteria, viruses, influenza, TB, common stuff you see on a medical call. We also have special hazard emergencies. These emergencies are just as dangerous as the rest, but we don't see them as often, so people get kind of complacent. Uh, for woods fires, work boots, fire retardant suit, helmet, gloves, and eye protection is very important. You can use your turnout gear, but it's very bulky and can lead to dehydration and fatigue on very hot days if we have to be working outside. For rope rescue, you're gonna want a helmet, harness, and gloves ice water rescue suit for any sort of water rescue in cold environment, a PFD, which is a life jacket to protect yourself and keep you afloat and protect the suit from getting ripped and torn, and a life ring to help you float and whoever you're rescuing have the sled and rope so you can be pulled back ashore. For an MVA, which is the car accident, you're going to want turnout gear, a traffic vest, and also, EMTs might be wearing their duty uniform, so it's good to add an addition of the turnout gear for more protection. Hazmat scenes will have the fully encapsulated suit, depending on what material we're working with. The turnout gear might be suitable, your SCBA, and monitoring equipment so you know when you can take stuff off. And this leads us to gear maintenance. We want to be sure to inspect for damage make sure that the expiration date isn't past due. We typically use our turnout gear and service for about 10 years, and after that, we get rid of it. At the scene, we want to try to do some gross decon on the engines. We have a bu bucket and brush 
or hose line to get the bulk of what we can off of the firefighters and then put our gear right into the bags for washing. We have routine washing schedule. Village Station has our washer and dryer set up. This can be done in a matter of two hours or less. So there's no excuse for not washing our gear after a call and have it mandatory that we do this after an IDLH environment, such as a structure fire, being sure to change out our hoods so we can prevent cancer and keep going home at the end of the day. That concludes this portion of the training. Thank you. For this next part of your training, we're going to go over hazmat awareness for the first responder. We're going to identify some training requirements. We're going to identify your role as a awareness level first responder. We're going to go over your emergency response guidebook. Uh, hazmat agencies are defined using some different agencies. Uh, Department of Transportation does over the road. Uh, EPA obviously has to do with the environment. And then OSHA also plays a part in this. Um, hazmat incidents are very unique. They require specialized teams and specialized first responders. And they also demand a different operational approach. It's a lot slower than we are used to. Uh, there's five different levels. We're going to go over the first one today, which is awareness. The one after that is operations, followed by hazmat tech, specialist, and the incident commander. First responders at the awareness level are individuals who are likely to witness or discover a hazardous substance release and who have been trained to initiate the appropriate re emergency response by notifying the proper agencies. They would take no further action beyond this. As an awareness level, first thing you want to do is recognize. You want to isolate, if at all possible. Um, you want to protect the people around it. And then you want to notify the proper agencies. Uh, so in this unit, we're going to describe how we can identify a material, and then we're going to go over the four different sections of your emergency response guidebook. The first step is to recognize that it is indeed a hazardous material. Uh, and always remember that hazmat incidents don't necessarily have to be large in scale. Uh, the second step in our process here is you're going to attempt to identify the material. And you're going to basically use any available resource. If you can use binoculars or the placard, uh, bill of lading, etc. cetera. Uh, DOT breaks these placards up into nine different uh, divisions. And with them should be a number. If at all possible, you can refer to the DOT section of your emergency response guidebook. Uh, these are just some different papers and facility documents. So if they're on a rail line, it's called a way bill. If it's on the highway, it's a bill of lading. Airplanes have an air bill, and pipeline is marked with a pipeline marker at the cross rows of any other means of transport. We have three different zones to our incident. A uh, hot zone is where the contamination is present. Warm zone. Uh, is where we can do some life-saving care. That's where your decon decontamination is set up. And it's also a control zone between your cold zone and your hot zone. Uh, cold zone is where we should be as an awareness level. That's also going to be your treatment transport areas for your EMS and also rehab for the crews that have come out of decon. Books divided into sections by the different page border colors. Uh, there's white, yellow, blue, orange, and green. The white bordered pages are a table of contents. Uh, if you ever get confused, you can use it uh, as a how-to guide. That has your placard identification. Uh, and then it also has some different pictures that allow you to identify the different types of rail car and over-the-road trailers. The yellow bordered pages, uh, this goes by a list of dangerous goods in numerical order. Uh, it quickly identifies the guide to be consulted from the ID number that you can get off the placard or the bill of lading. Uh, the substances in there that are highlighted in yellow 
uh, should be treated specifically with the other section at the back of the book. There's just a quick overview. The blue bordered pages are similar to the yellow, except they go alphabetical by the name. Uh, same thing, some substances are highlighted in blue and should be treated specifically. Orange bordered pages, this provides all your safety recommendations. Uh, it's a 62 individual guides presented in a two page format. And you're gonna use the number that you find in either the yellow or the blue section to refer to the orange section, which is gonna give you your uh, isolation distances and such. There is guide number 128. The green bordered pages, this contains a table with list by ID number. This is the section you're going to use if in one of your first two sections you find it's highlighted. Uh, this has two different types of uh, recommended safe distances. The first one is your initial isolation, isolation distances and the second is a protective action distance. Um, and these are going to be your highlighted ones that are going to require a bigger evacuation initially. And that concludes this presentation. This will be our annual update for the public safety traffic flagging, which is our scene safety at emergency scenes. Remember that we're always in danger and we always have the uh, possibility of, of getting injured at a, at a scene. Our job as the public safety traffic flagger, whether you're a fire police or a, a, a regular firefighter, is to keep the scene safe. I'm going to skip past this slide here. Bear with me. What we're looking for is a way to keep our firefighters safe at a scene, whether it's a fire scene or a uh, traffic emergency scene. Obviously, we want our folks to stay safe and not be uh, injured in, in, the, in any of the incidents that, that happened during the scene. Traffic control is controlled by incident command. Whether you're a fire police or a uh, firefighter, you're gonna be working under incident command. Uh, first of all, we're concerned about your personal safety as the traffic controller, safety of your fellow firefighters, safety of those on scene, uh, safety of passers-by. Uh, traffic flow is important to us as well as public relations. This is gonna be required training from the Department of Labor. And we wanna look at identifying parking practices, et cetera, et cetera. Our goal is for you to know uh, and refresh your, your memory on main law, the manual of uniform traffic control devices in the FPA uh, protocols, as well as liability at a scene, and et cetera. Public safety traffic flagger is somebody who controls traffic flow at an emergency scene. We're required to be uh, trained and certified as a public safety traffic flagger when you first join the department, as well as have the annual updates such as this one. Training is going to be, uh, whether it's in person or via this video, uh, training is required. And you are required to wear a traffic safety vest when you're on scene, along with an appropriate helmet. Uh, you want to absolutely have your proper safety gear, whether it's the box light or the uh, traffic wands that, that the fire police use. Uh, you can use a stop slow paddle, uh, but be sure that you have it lighted and it has proper uh, identification so that it is clearly visible to oncoming traffic. Under the main state law, drivers are required to obey our signal when we're at a, uh, at, at a public safety emergency. A violation is defined as a, a class D misdemeanor. Uh, if you feel that the, the uh, offense is so egregious that you need to bring it to the attention of your superior or the chief, do so. They'll make a decision on whether or not to take the issue and, and pursue it further. A flagger is somebody who's assigned to traffic control duty at a fire emergency scene. Anybody under 18 is not allowed to direct traffic, period, whether or not they are a junior firefighter, they are not allowed to be out in the traffic scene. Good heavens. We want you to go ahead and, and plan for uh, any kind of upcoming emergencies here in town of Gray. We have pre-plans for the Apple Tree Village area, for the Gray Manor area, for Shaker Road and the Route 26 bypass, and for other major roads. Go ahead and, and in the back of your mind, as you're heading to the scene, be sure that you're pre-planning for how are you going to get traffic through or around the scene that you're heading to? Obviously, our, our protection for ourselves is pre-planning, is understanding the traffic flow, 
understanding the human factor, and knowing how to direct traffic, and of course, just plain old common sense. Equipment basics, absolutely you will wear a traffic safety vest that is absolutely required by our department protocols, and, and also for your own personal safety. You will wear a uh, helmet with reflective material on the helmet, and at nighttime especially, you absolutely will have either a box light or traffic wands to keep yourself safe. You also want to dress for the weather. If it's rainy weather, obviously, if you can, can wear gloves that will keep your hands dry in the rainy weather to keep your hands warm in the wintertime, dress accordingly in layers, et cetera. And for nighttime especially, be sure that you have proper protection for your, uh, yourself to keep yourself see, uh, safe at, in, at nighttime. Traffic control devices are signs, channelizing devices, lighting devices, pavement markers, et cetera. They have to obviously meet our need for controlling traffic and keeping, and keeping us safe and moving traffic either around or through the scene. Uh, and obviously we want to give enough time for traffic to uh, respond to our uh, signals with the way that our equipment is set up. Traffic cones are used at our scenes. Uh, that is a requirement for our department. Uh, ideally, we want to use five cones for the initial uh, taper on a scene. However, if time does not allow or if we are shorthanded, we can uh, get by with three cones. The requirement is five. But we definitely want to channel uh, the taper so that such that traffic is uh, moved around our scene and around our uh, buffer area. If we are going to be using stop and slope paddles, uh, be sure that you have one on each side of the scene and be aware that once the paddle turns around and shows slow, the drivers will go whether or not we want them to. So we want to be aware that we are properly handling traffic using the stop and slope paddles. Remember, of course, that uh, the traffic control devices provide warning only and are a suggestion only, and that drivers will uh, often ignore our signals because uh, of their, their uh, general habit of driving through a scene. For 1055s, obviously for a minor 1055, we want to respond and uh, get to the scene and, and allow for, traffic, uh, for safe traffic uh, flow for our vehicles arriving at the scene. For a major incident, we also want to look at possibly uh, either closing down the traffic and doing detours and having additional personnel for the detour area. For fires, for investigations, we normally would not have a need for traffic control. For, certainly for a working fire, we would need traffic control uh, to direct people around the scene. For rescue, once again, a uh, standard rescue does not require traffic control, but for a heavy duty rescue, depending on if extrication is needed, et cetera, that would also then in involve traffic control. Hazmat may involve traffic control there. You would s report to Central and be dispatched uh, accordingly. And for other incidents, whether it's storm related or other incidents assisting police, et cetera, uh, will get toned out and you'll uh, be asked to respond accordingly. Getting to the scene, we generally recommend that you take a POV if you know for sure that you will be assigned as a traffic control person. That allows you to move your traffic control station depending on the needs of the scene. However, for your personal safety or if we're going to be on the turnpike, there you will ride the emergency vehicle, uh, whatever vehicle you, you uh, are able to, to get on board safely. Uh, obviously, be sure that you have your gear with you and that you're properly dressed in your full protective gear before you get onto the vehicle. Incident command system, we follow the incident command system, as you know, at, at, at any scene, uh, you're under the command of uh, the incident commander. Uh, when you are at a scene, you will establish uh, the initial traffic control person. The initial traffic control person will take point on the flow of traffic, and then the, the other traffic control person at the other end of the scene will be secondary. If, you're, if you take on the role of, of uh, traffic control, then you will make the decisions on moving traffic in which direction, et cetera and uh, you will uh, deal with the, the secondary. Uh, ideally, here at, at uh, Town of Prairie, we want to use hand signals, if at all possible, line of sight to keep ourselves off the radio. If we do have to go on the radio at a minor scene, we could stay on primary, but generally, we'll want to go to 280, to the, what's uh, known as the Chief's Channel, or TAC-1, uh, the idea being that we want to stay off the main uh, frequency if we could have to be doing uh, talking on the radio for traffic control. Initially, whoever arrives at the scene is going to make sure that the scene is safely set up. Uh, ideally, Incident Command uh, will uh, make a decision on parking for the incoming vehicles. You'll check with Incident Command and get a, a decision on where vehicles will go. You'll then uh, aim the vehicles at the proper parking position. Knowing where the vehicles are going to end up also allows you to, to more uh, properly set up scene safety, whether it's buffer zones or having to stop traffic to let vehicles in to the assigned positions uh, on, on the scene. 
Um, obviously, blocking left and right will be important for you to uh, understand where the incoming vehicles are going to go. You do want to be sure that the vehicles are in the shadow area at a scene, and you may have to expand your, your buffer zone, your safety area, depending on the uh, needs as the scene expands for our scene safety. As you know, firefighters uh, have the authority to redirect traffic at an emergency scene. Uh, obviously, we want to set the scene up in such a way that uh, incoming traffic or, or passing traffic uh, understands the need to safely stop or safely move around our scene. We want to, we want to use cones and other uh, channelizing devices in such a way that they uh, don't have any choice but to follow our directions for a safe scene. <coughs> Just a quick reminder that the um, scenes, uh, scene durations, a major scene is anything uh, exceeding 30 minutes to, to, uh, to two hours. Uh, a minor scene is, um, is, is up to 30 minutes. And then a temporary scene is often where the, uh, where the traffic is, is uh, stopped momentarily while we move vehicles off the road. Um, so generally, we want to be prepared that a, a major scene means that, that we will uh, be either stopping traffic or redirecting traffic for, for several hours at a time. It may involve uh, detours for minor scenes. It may be a, a temporary uh, redirection of traffic around the scene, and then we want to very quickly clear the scene or move off to the side of the road if at all possible. Obviously, we want to be sure that our uh, that we are setting up our, our um, safety zone to avoid any kind of, of an incident. Here you can see that the in these photographs that the uh, incoming vehicles were not uh, prepared to stop properly for the fire department and so we want to be sure that we do not take a chance with ourselves obviously if, if we get injured or if our, our firefighters get injured uh, we, we don't want to have anybody losing the ability to take care of their family or to 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 uh, lose the ability to work and continue either as a firefighter or in other work work that they may be doing full-time Firefighters need to respond to a scene uh, at each time at, 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 as if uh, people are trying to run you over. And I, I'm not joking when I say that really and truly we, we have to look at going into a scene uh, with the understanding that uh, people coming at us are, may not see us. They may be uh, distracted by uh, a phone call. They may be distracted by the fact that they, they are not expecting us to be there in the scene. And so we want to be sure that we uh, are prepared for them to uh, not be looking for us as they come up on scene and set up our scene accordingly. Closing all the partway uh, of the road for exceeding two hours is the major scene. Obviously, the 30 minutes to two hours is an intermediate, and then a minor is anything under 30 minutes. Majority of our calls here in Gray are in the intermediate to, to a minor uh, duration for half an hour to, to, to an hour. Uh, so we can generally expect ourselves to get uh, on scene and off scene quickly. Uh, obviously, upstream is the direction from which traffic is flowing. We want to be sure that the upstream side is properly marked and that we have a good taper on the upstream side. We want to set up a proper taper and set up a proper buffer zone uh, as, as safely as we can. For an incident on the turnpike, we will generally set up uh, a taper on the working lane in which the accident has occurred. Uh, ideally, we'll try to add another lane for safety. So if the incident is on the shoulder, we'll actually block the uh, lane right next to it and have traffic moving only on the, on the um, lane closest to the uh, other side of the road. Once the scene is completed, then the only thing we have to watch out for is as our, our vehicles are leaving the scene, uh, at that point, once again, we may take a few minutes and stop all traffic temporarily while we move traffic off the scene. Uh, at that point, then, if, if traffic is fully stopped, we can then go back to one-way traffic. Once our vehicles are clear of the, of the blocked lane, we can then go to two-way traffic. Be sure that you're safely off the side of the road as you start your, your uh, two-way traffic. And then once traffic is flowing, you can then proceed to either your uh, vehicle in which you arrived, if it's an emergency vehicle, or to your POV to leave the scene. Plan for your own safety as you approach. Uh, plan to, to keep yourself safe as the scene progresses. Make sure that you're working and acting safely. Are you alert and aware of what's going on around you? Make sure you're checking with your fellow firefighters to see that they, they are staying safe as well. Uh, try to have a checklist of items for each scene, uh, whether it's your uh, traffic safety vest, your helmet, your flashlights or your, your, uh, your traffic wands or whatever other emergency equipment that you need. Um, for a long term, you may want to keep a snack or drink in the car and be prepared for a long duration incident. You may need to check with incident command for um, personal breaks as needed and to, to take care of any personal needs. 
for best practices, obviously, we want to place the first arriving apparatus in, in, into a, such a point way that they block the scene to create a shadow. We want to have all of our responding personnel properly off in, in that shadow area. Uh, we want to keep damaged vehicles, road debris, et cetera, uh, safely out of the uh, flow of traffic. And uh, we want to, as quickly as possible, uh, clear the traffic scene using uh, the proper, uh, prop proper protocols. Always maintain and be aware of the high risk of moving in and near moving traffic. Whenever you're setting up traffic cones, you want to walk towards the traffic as you're setting up the cones. As you're removing the cones, you want to face traffic and move backwards as you're picking up cones or walk into the, to the cone area. Either way, you want to be facing traffic as traffic is moving towards you. Uh, do avoid turning your back on traffic. And as you exit and enter from the crew cabs, uh, whether it's your POV or the emergency vehicle, be sure that you're looking for traffic moving around you. For interstate highway, once again, you want to assign a flagger to monitor approaching traffic. There, the flagger will, will do less traffic control and more monitoring of a situation once the cones are set up. But the emergency flagger uh, at, at a turnpike scene will be uh, watching for oncoming vehicles that might be ignoring the flow of traffic and uh, will then warn uh, people on the scene about that. When the time comes to leave the scene, we want all vehicles to leave the uh, turnpike scene at the same time so that we can be safely off the, off the turnpike scene. Uh, and at that point, you would pull up cones and be sure that you're safely in the vehicle before leaving. Once again, uh, for, fire, for safety at a scene, you will block at least one lane. We want to block, if you're going to be uh, pumping water at a scene, you want to block so that the pump panel is downstream. And you may have to request additional help from either a uh, local sheriff or state police or from additional uh, fire police or other firefighters. For nighttime, we want to turn off headlights on all vehicles. We ideally would like to lessen the, the amount of flashing lights, especially at nighttime. Be aware that for nighttime operations, if there's a, uh, a fire vehicle behind you with lights flashing, it will block the vision of drivers that are coming at you. So you often will want to be on the other side of the road from where the uh, flashing lights are so that they can clearly see you and your flashlight or your traffic wands. Be aware, though, that at nighttime you may not be visible, so if at all possible, try to get a scene light on yourself or try to operate underneath the traffic light so that vehicles can see you. Watch for oncoming traffic. Obviously, we want to terminate uh, the, the incident as quickly as we can to keep ourselves safe. In summary, crashes and congestion are an unfortunate fact of life. Quick clearance will help us to keep ourselves safe as well as those passing through the scene. Clearing the scene quickly requires uh, commitment cooperation and cooperation from all of us. Never trust oncoming traffic. Avoid turning your back to approaching traffic. Establish an initial block with the first, uh, 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 first arriving fire apparatus. Wear your full PPE, always, always, at a scene especially. Uh, reminder that when, when you're wearing a traffic vest, be sure you zip it up in the front because we need that 360 degree reflection on your body to keep yourself safe. Turn off uh, the headlights on all vehicles so that you can, uh, so you do not blind oncoming traffic. The only time you might want to leave headlights on is if the vehicle is lighting you as the public safety traffic flagger. Certainly we want to use traffic cones and incident signs to control traffic direction. And once again, establish a flagger as the traffic controller so that uh, everybody else will follow that, that person's directions. Thank you. This concludes the annual training required by the Maine Bureau of Labor. Thank you for your attention. We will now address any questions you may have on any of the topics covered.